Привет, товарищи. There is a time to punch Nazis. We're not there yet. But those of you opposing them seem to be doing your level best to get us there. Please stop. Since taking the radical stance that you shouldn't just punch people for holding different opinions than you, having weathered the Xbox versus PlayStation wars, um, I've been accused of being a Nazi apologist repeatedly, despite clarifying what I'm talking about. Uh, I've also seen all kinds of other, frankly, stupid arguments about appeasement or people glamorizing their anti fascist activity in the 70s and 80s and so on, failing to recognize that we're at a different stage in, in what's going on and that their actions are genuinely aiding the very people that they want to attack. We're in a different context, we're in a different stage, things are slightly different this time around, but There are similarities, there are things we can draw upon, there are experiences we can draw upon. I'm not a Nazi apologist or a Nazi sympathizer. I find their ideas repellent, abhorrent. I just do not think that at this stage of things, it's the right thing to do to punch them. And I think that my position is thoroughly supported by history and is thoroughly supported by what has been going on. So I want to kind of expand on that and explain to you why you're wrong when you call back to anti-fascist activity in the 70s and 80s, why you're wrong when you call back to World War II, um, when, you, when you call back to cable streams. So I did a whole video on that that apparently people haven't watched properly. But so I want to go over how, you know, how typically you, you get to authoritarian right-wing regimes when it's appropriate to get into violence and why that's not inappropriate uh, why that's not appropriate yet perhaps the most important precondition for a radical or extremist authoritarian regime is financial hardship so you can look back into the interwar period you can see the great depression as being the trigger you know, after a certain amount of lag that caused the rise of extremism um, or a radical change or what passes for radical change in the case of the United States you know, a, a, across the world. Now the Great Recession is in no way as big of a deal as the Great Depression was but it has triggered exactly the same kind of response. Um, Trump Brexit, the rise of the far right across the Western world, um, but it's not identical. It's not as deep. It's not as powerful. It's not as strong. But it has been incredibly uneven in terms of class. In that austerity has fallen most heavily upon the working and I guess lower middle class. What constitutes the middle class is increasingly fuzzy and it's increasingly shrinking. So you can see the similarities there. There's a lot of people who are hard up. Um, it's definitely a class thing. The, this is a result of neoliberal um, economics and politics, but has also partially been the result of the way in which the left of a kind has become obsessed with first world problems and has laid a lot of the blame upon people on the basis of identity categories, so male, white, whatever, even though in many nations it's the case that these are the groups that are in many ways the, hard, the hardest up now, um, or at least not doing very well at all, you know, comparable to other groups that do get political attention from that, from that same group. This is an issue, um, and it's hard to get people to acknowledge and recognize they're always going, no, 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 poor white people, oh, they've had it so bad for such a long time. But that just, yeah, you can't ignore 
all of these demographics in, in this way, you, you have to do something for them. It's not appeasement, it's just caring for people who are having, having a hard time, and that should be done regardless of colour and so on. If you don't do that, then it leads to what we have seen, which is resentment, hatred and fear towards immigrant communities, towards the other. Um, and that's, I guess, what we can cover next. So economic downturns and the accompanying poverty, such as we saw in the interwar period, such as we saw in the 70s Britain, you know, these are precursor conditions. So they create kind of the, the atmosphere from which everything else can then emerge. So people are hard up. They have to scrabble for everything that they have. And that can set them against each other. So even though poor immigrants, poor refugees, poor working class whites, the underclass people out of work, even though they should have a common cause in terms of class, you know, they're all impoverished for basically the same reasons, not enough work and so on. But this can create a resentment in the native population, for want of another word, towards outsiders because they're competing for those scant resources that are available. The, the welfare that's available, the assistance, the training, the housing, access to doctors, dentists, all the rest of it. So you've got people who are impoverished and then you've got other people who are, or at least look like the other to these people who are competing for these scant resources that are available for the poor. And the fighting gets so vicious precisely because the stakes are so small. Um, as, as people say, I mean, I was re with reference to academia, but the point hold, seems to hold true across everything else. So you have this natural well of resentment which these people can tap into to turn people against each other, basically, and to create a stronger identity. That's often, at least in Western nations, this white nativist identity that these people are coming over here, they're taking our jobs, they're taking our women, they're using up our NHS spaces, whatever else it might be. And it's very easy to, to tap into that resentment because, you know, austerity hits, hits the poor worst and the money that does become a, available and you know, the, the, the benefits that immigration and so on brings to a country are not evenly distributed. They don't get reinvested into the poor. They don't get reinvested into the, into the working class. So all those benefits are not seen. But the disadvantage side is resources do get stretched, the NHS does get stretched, welfare issues do become more of a problem, housing does get stretched, and the money that comes to the overall economy from immigration does not get redistributed in such a way as to shore up these services and to diffuse this potential tension. That's a mistake, that's a problem, and lo and behold that's exactly what we've seen happen again with austerity and so on, and now the attempts to privatise the NHS uh, and all the rest is only really possible because the blame is being misdirected. So fascism and extremism really kind of taps in on this idea of fear. Now you can argue that what I'm saying is tapping into fear of the ruling class, tapping into fear of capitalism, whatever. I would argue that's more justified, that there are more genuine threats. Um, that's not to say there aren't genuine issues around immigration, so I've just sketched out some of them, but there are different approaches. You know. This has been probably the big mistake of the last five to ten years in that the, the left has been completely unwilling to discuss these issues or to even present alternative solutions. We've ceded the ground and given the right free reign to build up fear and resentment and to offer their solutions, which is basically to tell other people to fuck off. Um, this isn't good. We, we, we ceded the ground. We refused to have the argument. Anyone who tried to have the argument was branded as being right-wing, even if they were left or centrist or just a rationalist or a skeptic or whatever else. This was a huge mistake. The other source of fear that these extremist movements and so on tap into um, is the idea of the oppressor or the traitor or a conspiracy. In the interwar period, this would have been targeted primarily against the Jews in a lot of places. A lot of it was actually more like anti-establishment, but through the lens of race. And what I find fascinating that a lot of people do not seem to see the same comparisons in 
is a lot of people are basically taught that the Jews were seen as being subhuman and inferior. This was more the case about the propaganda against uh, blacks, Chinese, Japanese, pe people like that. It wasn't so much the case with the Jews, at least not initially. Rather, the propaganda against the Jews represented them as some kind of genius-level conspiracy that was manipulating everything behind the scenes, that was the oppressor class that was in control and in charge of everything. Now, what I find fascinating is to compare that propagandizing against Jews with a lot of the propagandizing and hatred that comes from the left at the moment, blaming things on a non-existent white supremacy and a non-existent patriarchy in the way that Nazis and other fascists blamed the non-existent Jewish conspiracy, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and all the rest of it, and spun that into this big conspiracy theory of the oppressor that you would then rise up against and, and remove. So I see parallels there that a lot of people don't really seem to tap into. Um, they don't seem to seem to draw the comparison. And most of that is on the left. But the right have their own conspiracies, still the anti-Semitic, still everything else. And as well as that, you have specifically in, in the modern context, fear of Islamism, fear of Muslims, fear of the undermining of our culture. Um, and there are issues around that. And again, the left has conceded the conversation to the right who have blown it out of all proportion and have fed massively on it. Terrorism is an issue. The misogynistic treatment of women in Islamic societies and so on is an issue. And yet the left has allied itself with Islam. And it's not entirely clear why. I mean, there's so many things there that the left should be against but they're not. But that's getting off, off track. The point is, economic issues, instability, fear, all of these things are already in place. Okay, They're different, they're not quite to the same extent, they're not quite the same targets. The, the people, that you know, the sides of the political argument, who is hating who, has changed slightly, but you can see that same precondition existing. So that tick, that's been met. Now the final piece that really seems to bring these authoritarian and radical groups to the fore, whatever wing of the political spectrum they're on, is public support, public sympathy. And this is where you're making your mistake. When you go back to the violent repression of the fascists in the interwar period, then you're looking at times when they were massive, when they were organized, when they were already being violent, when there was an imminent threat. Um, and in those cases, the violence was retaliatory, basically. Um, that, that's the point at which, at which violence is justified. Or you're looking at times when they were already at war. That's another time violence is justified. When you go back to the 70s, you know, we had roaming gangs of skinheads. There was the, you know, the National Front and racist groups and so on were heavily intermingled into football hooliganism culture and and that was violent you know you had gangs of skinheads rushing into clubs and taking them over and beating people and so on that's not going on now so when you hark back to that i mean that's all well and good that was retaliatory that was protective that was defensive violence had already been initiated that's not the case now all right there's a few you know lone wolves shooting up places occasionally but the mass movement the mass threatening movement the protests turning to riots the large groups of black bloc and, and so on that's not happening on the far right it's happening on the far left and it's terrifying and scaring people and it's making them wonder if the right has a point and that is how you're making the mistake that is what fed the rise of the right in the interwar period. Fear of the of the communists, revolutionaries and so on, wanting to, to stave them off. The violence that was coming from the left, which was inflicted on the right. The repression and censorship coming from the government towards these groups, the banning of uniforms and so on. I went over a lot of this in the, in the um, Cable Street video, which I suggest you go and watch if you want a shorter version of what I'm telling you here. But all of these things 
that you're currently engaged in are things that created the massive public sympathy and really boosted up these right-wing movements and took them to a point of, of critical mass or near critical mass in the case of the, of the British black shirts. I mean, I can't impress this point enough. I can't bang on about it enough. I will keep challenging people who seem to think that it's okay to victimize and punch people simply for standing and expressing an opposing point of view. However reprehensible that, that view is, unless it's a direct call for violence, there is no justification in sucker punching them. There is no justification in censoring them. And as history has shown, you only empower them when you do so. As current events are showing you only empower them when you do so. Again, I need to drive this point home. Before he was punched, Richard Spencer was basically nobody. He wasn't on anyone's radar. Best he could do was get 200 hipster Nazis together in a room to do a cheap imitation of a Zeke Heil. That, that, that was basically it. And people overreported that, and that was a mistake as well. When he got punched, his social media followings doubled and doubled again. Does that sound like, like progress? Does that sound like it's hurting him in any way? No. And we've had this massive debate about is it okay to punch people out of nowhere for no reason other than they're expressing their point of view. And that should not be a contentious point. And by excusing it and allowing for it and making an apologia for it, you have turned the libertarians against you, you've turned the centre ground against you, you've turned the rational left against you, you've turned anyone with a, with a sense of morality, really, ag against you. And that doesn't mean that they're for your opposition, or what they believe or whatever, but it has created more sympathy and more leeway for them. We can look at Milo as well, and Milo is not a Nazi, he's not a fascist, he's a preening narcissistic twat who will say anything for attention, basically. He's a troll. He is the tulpa of slash pole. That that's that's what he is. Okay. Occasionally he does things that are good, almost by accident. You know, he's latched on to some of the men's issues and has helped publicise them. That's good. Um, he has latched on to some of the the problems and excessive modern modern feminism. That's good. He toys with some racist stuff, which is bad. He kind of played and flirted with the alt right for a bit. That was bad, though in some ways good, since it shifted them to the left in a way, made them a bit lighter. So in some ways that's good. He has definitely highlighted free speech issues across American academia and universities. That's good. But overall, he is a dick who does things for attention. But let's pretend he's a he is a fascist, whatever you want, whatever you want to call him. Do you think rioting at Berkeley, smashing shit up? trying to silence him at other venues, you know, protesting him uh, in the venues, disrupting stuff. Do you think that's hurt him in any way? Or has it fed his ego, fed his media presence, and fed the sales of his the book that's coming out? Dangerous. Don't know what happened to the Gaming Aid book. I guess that's on the back burner. Not enough money anymore. But do you think that hurt him? No, it pumped him right up to the bestsellers again. It got him on every major news channel on traditional media. Um, it got his videos more hits, it got his websites more hits, it got Breitbart more hits. Do you think that helps? I don't feed the troll works as well in real life as it does anywhere else. Past a certain point, past a certain critical mass, then the stuff that you're doing becomes justified, but not yet. And at the moment you're only helping them. You've created sympathy for them, you've given them exposure, what are you doing? You know, they're not being uh, violent to people. There aren't roaming gangs of skinheads going around bursting into gay bars and beating everyone up. You know, there's no mass right-wing political party uh, to the extent that we're talking about. Indeed, from a, a longer-term perspective, you could say that the Conservative government in the UK and Trump in the US is kind of a, a safety valve to prevent the rise of fascism rather than being fascistic themselves. They're shit, they're terrible, we should be resisting them in effective ways, but they're still within the system. They're not without the system, they're not overturning the system per se. 
So in the long term, that might be good, especially when it, things inevitably swing back the other way in reaction to their excesses. We shall see. Depends if the opposition can get their act together. But this, this is the point I want to really, really make to you, is that with your violence, with your repression, with your censorship and so on, you are helping them. You are giving them the Streisand effect. Um, while there are problems with censorship of the internet and, and so on that affect everybody, and they can be reduced in some ways, the internet still roots around censorship as though it would damage. And so every time you try to repress and censor in this new media landscape, all it does is drive people to make them more interesting. There's the Streisand effect. So everything that you're doing while you're claiming to be opposed to these people, and I'm opposed to them on many scores too, you're helping them. And I really, really wish you would stop. History tells us that this is not the time for the tactics that you are engaging in. You need to wait until they reach that, that critical point. That's the point at which violence becomes justified. Not this. When you engage in violence now, when you engage in censorship now, when you engage in repression now, you are feeding the beast. You are making their conspiracy theories and so on seem more legitimate. You are making what they are saying seem more interesting. You are making it seem more dangerous. People are asking themselves, why are a bunch of left-wing protesters who are for gay rights and, and, and so on, why are they attacking and trying to censor a, a, a gay guy of Jewish ancestry? Well, what, what's going on here? What, hmm, this seems strange. I should look into this. And maybe they'll find things that they sympathize with. Maybe when they look to Spencer, they'll see things that you've refused to discuss for ages about immigration and so on. Maybe they'll find something that interests them. Maybe they'll find something they agree with. You know, even a broken clock is right, you know, twice a day, as they say. I don't know how I can put it more explicitly. I, I keep trying. Maybe I'm getting through to some people. I don't know. But please, I implore you. I do not want things to go further to the right. I do not want fascism in the UK or the US. And I don't think we're under imminent threat of it. But everything that you're doing threatens to make that happen. There's a time for violence. It's not yet. And engaging in what you're doing is helping them. What you're doing is helping them. What you are doing is helping them. Please, please stop. Zang. <laughs> Grim gave a big yawn and settled down to sleep. And of course, when Grim goes to sleep, all of his friends go to sleep too. The people on the internet were just text on a screen, the collectibles were just cheap plastic tat, and the books were just elaborate sandwiches made of wood and paper. Even Grim himself, once he was asleep, was just an old saggy goth twat, baggy and a bit loose at the seams, and nobody loved him. <laughs>